A new press book. Welcome to RTB 2021 for October the 31st, 21. Happy Reformation Day and happy Halloween, I guess, uh, as well. Uh, wonderful Sunday today in the life of our church as we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, and to, to anticipate uh, doing that one day once again in, in, uh, in Christ's restored kingdom, uh, even as we remember uh, through the Lord's Supper his great work on our behalf. Uh, his shed blood for us and his body broken for us as well. So our text for today, we've got 2 Kings 13, uh, 2 Timothy 3, one of the more famous texts uh, regarding the scriptures in the Bible. Uh, then we have Hosea 5 and 6, and then finally one Psalm 119. We'll finish up Psalm 119 going from uh, chapter or verses uh, 145 through 176. So why don't we start there in Psalm 119. Uh, so we, I think I've said just about all I can say about Psalm 119 uh, as a whole, but here in the text we have a couple of things that are repeated over and over again, uh, very typical of, of Hebrew poetry. Uh, but I think it was, in, it was interesting, I don't know if you noticed this in reading through um, Psalm 119, particularly in uh, in verses 145 through 160, you have repeated several times over uh, this exhortation, this plea to God to revive, uh, to revive me, revive me. And so we have it in uh, verse 149. We have it again in verse uh, 154, 156, 159. Um, the last of these revive me's, uh, in, uh, and I may be missing one. I don't think I am. But it, last of these uh, is uh, based on God's own loving kindness and faithfulness, his chesed. There's that phrase once again. So it revived me according to your loving kindness. Again, many times in the, in the Psalms, we see this, right? That the psalmist uh, pleads for salvation based on the character of God himself, that God is like this. Father, we know that you are like this, so please act this way towards us. But of course, uh, the other revive means I think are kind of interesting because they are all based on the word of God. Revive me according to your ordinances, verse 149. Revive me according to your word. Revive me once again according to your ordinances. That's an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it? Uh, so the, the spiritual renewal uh, that the psalmist experiences comes from, um, comes from the scriptures themselves. Uh, so this is something that is gained according to uh, the scriptures. And so I think that's, a, that's um, true for us as well, right? That uh, if you look at just corporately, uh, any great movements and revivals in the life of, of God's people throughout the history has always been tied to a return to God's word. Uh, but I think we can also say that on a personal level, probably some of you can even attest to this, that anytime you've experienced a personal revival, it's always been tied to ultimately to God's, God's word and a return to God's word personally. Uh, then at the end of Psalm 119 here in the last uh, verses, last eight verses, the Tav verses, again, all these starting with the Hebrew letter Tav, uh, you have a series of what we would call uh, the, the technical term form is justives. Uh, they are uh, the, these verbs that are um, expressing volition in a third person sense. Uh, so let my cry, let my supplication, let my lips, let my tongue, let, my, let your hand, uh, let my soul. Uh, so the, it, the psalm ends with these, um, these desperate pleas to God uh, that uh, everything about him uh, will come up before the Lord, uh, and that will everything about him will, will praise the Lord. Uh, this is a, it's a wonderful psalm, isn't it, to, uh, to refocus us, not just on God's word, but through God's word to refocus us on, on, on him. So, Psalm 119. Let's move over to, uh, while we're speaking of the word of God, while we move over to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. Again, we've looked at 2 Timothy before, but um, in, this, in this text, uh, specifically, Paul is talking about the, the challenges that await Timothy. Uh, he's almost kind of being prophetic here uh, that in the last days, difficult times are going to come. Now, of course, the last days began with the early church, and they're continuing even to today, and we can kind of see 
uh, the, what Paul talks about then is actually still true for us today, right? Uh, that men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and so on and so forth. Um, and in, in the midst of this, of course, we are to be different. We're to be uh, those who uh, are ultimately, uh, you know, living our lives holy, separated from the world around us and dedicated to God. And when we do so, Paul promises um, in verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Notice he doesn't say some. No, he doesn't say, oh, you know, most of them, but all who desire to live godly will, uh, will in fact, be persecuted. Uh, and it's because of this evil world that, that surrounds us. Um, so what is, what is the... Um, what is the, the, the rock in which we can ground our lives? What's the, um, what's the fortress that we can uh, find refuge in? Uh, well, it is in, of course, God himself, uh, but it is also in his word and his promises we find in his word. And of course, uh, in 2 Timothy 3, uh, verses 16 and 17, we have one of the most uh, clearest and most profound statements of the inspiration and authority of scripture that we have in the bible probably the one that most you know most people turn to when they seek to describe well what is the scripture well paul describes it here it is in fact uh god breathed uh, or inspired but literally that text that word in the in the greek is uh, god breathed that nuptos it's a word that paul just makes up um puts two words together and theos and uh nuptos and so we um we have those two words put together. The breath of, of God is uh, what we find in the scriptures. And uh, it's, a, it's a powerful word picture, right, of the inspiration of, of the scriptures. But the scriptures don't just have an inherent quality about them, uh, but they do something. What do they do? Uh, well, they are profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Uh, so they do something to us. And what is the result, Paul writes? Uh, well, that result, he tells us, is that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Uh, so in this world of persecution, in this world where uh, you have false teachers, in this world where you have, um, you know, a world that's going against the teachings of God, uh, what we find is the scriptures will, uh, because of their inherent quality and because they do something to us, will equip us for good works within that world. Uh, so, uh, in the context of Second Timothy, I think this makes those statements on the Scripture even that much more powerful. Second Timothy three. Let's move over to uh, go over to Second Kings. So, Second Kings thirteen. We've got two things that are speaking of the power of the prophetic word. Uh, we have here a uh, kind of at least in the first thirteen verses, we have two kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, that are following in succession. Uh, we have Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz, and then you have Jehoash, uh, very similar uh, names here. And also Jehoash is a very similar name to, um, to the Jewish king uh, Joash that we just looked at. In fact, in the Hebrew text, it actually alternates the names back and forth. Generally, our English Bibles will call Joash the king of, of Judah, and Jehoash, the king of Israel, just to remove the uh, confusion there. But in the Hebrew text, it actually kind of bounces back and forth. Uh, names are very similar uh, in, in meaning as well. So, um, but then this, this text ends with uh, the, the death of, the, of Elisha, the great prophet. Uh, and he continues on with his prophetic ministry. You see here, he's even ministering to um, to Joash or Jehoash here, the king of Israel, uh, even at even up until his the time of his death, and then he dies, and then you have this amazing story of of a man being tossed down on his bones, and he comes back to life. Uh, wouldn't you love to have seen that? Uh, well, here we have, I think, again a a story that illustrates uh, the power of of the prophetic word that when um, God inspires that word. Uh, even as he does in, in our scriptures, uh, that there is a, there's definitely a power to that. So, and of course that would have made a, 
huge impact on that original audience in exile at the time. And then finally, let's go over to uh, Hosea and um, Hosea 5 and 6 is our text for today. Uh, remember, this is in a section in Hosea that's uh, offering some uh, specific uh, cases against Israel uh, that began with um, chapter 4. And, uh, and specifically, what, we've, what we have in chapter 5 is the case is brought against the leaders of Israel. So especially the priest in verse 1 and the king. And, and it's those leadership, it's the shepherds of Israel that have led Israel astray, which leads Israel to anticipate somebody who wouldn't lead them astray, who would be the, the priest and the king that they, that they need. Um, they, it is their pride, verse uh, 5, that works against them. Um, and they have determined to uh, follow man's command, verse 11 and not God's. And what this results in is uh, they have transgressed the covenant, which has kind of been the argument of the entire book. Uh, so what does God desire? What does God uh, desire from his people? Uh, well, he wants them to, verse one of chapter six, return to him. Uh, and the promise is that if they do return, he will heal, he will bandage, he will, uh, that which has been uh, torn because of their sin. God has has disciplined them because of their sin, but if they return, he will restore. Uh, and what does God desire in the future? That they delight uh, in loyalty, that they they exhibit covenant loyalty is what it's talking about here. Not just sacrifice, not just going through the motions of their faith, but a loyalty that's like the loyalty of a husband for a wife or a wife for a husband, that kind of covenantal loyalty and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God doesn't want uh, just our expressions of uh, kind of road practice of religion, right? So uh, if we brought this into the modern day uh, sense, he doesn't want us just to, um, you know, make sure you're checking off all the boxes on your, on your offering envelope. Uh, brought my Bible, uh, read my Bible, prayed a few prayers and came to church. Uh, but he wants our devotion. Uh, he wants our hearts. Uh, it, and again, the, the analogy uh, with the marriage works well here, right? So if, as it regards your spouse, if you're married, um, they don't want you just to kind of go through the motions with them, uh, but they want your devotion. They want your love. And God does his, desires this from his people uh, as well. So that's Hosea 5. And six, I think we hit Second Timothy three and Second Kings thirteen and Psalm one nineteen. So we're all done for the day. I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day on this Sunday, October thirty first. And uh, remember, it is Reformation Day. And I think I'll talk about some of this in in my sermon this week. So uh, hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday, wonderful Lord's Day. <laughs>